Today I began to dig. I am enormously excited. Enormously. Today I began to dig. Took my first bite of the earth. Put in my first pick. Astonishing that I have actually begun. Hard to believe. A beginning. With that first blow, what elation I felt. Feel. I am light. I float, although there is no wind. I swoop low to gather altitude, the way the roller coaster does. And there I see the thick world differently. Engineless and silent, I float under everything as easily as an image in the water. At last, at long last, I felt fistfuls in my fists. Like Uncle Bolt, I've got a good grip. I shall split the earth asunder. Ha! I write, yes, with a heavy, bulbous exclamation point borrowed from the comics. Pow! The very absurdity of my swing, its narrow place and expansive purpose, made the blow I struck like a culminating thrust. I've acquired a short-handled pick like my build. Bam! Well, it's dirty, squatty work. But what a perfect location for the trap. Better than under a bed or beneath a stove. Better than a shower or a john. Better even than an attic, although going up to get down has much to recommend it. Of course, I've been clearing away dirt and rust and ash, coal clinkers and undefinable dusts for quite a while, weeks, carrying out all kinds of wet gunk in two-pound coffee cans and loads of crusty stuff like shale I've scraped from the bottom of the firebox. That damn cat has been shitting there, coming through a pipe, I suppose, who knows, and finding cinders suitable. It is a barfy business. Ugh! But today I began to dig. Yes. Oh, yes! By becoming a worm, this worm turns. Nervous, 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 I tiptoe down the stairs. It is another day. My guard is still asleep. The basement has a welcome moist smell like deep woods after rain. I imagine mushrooms, soft black leaves. I have learned the place like a lover. I know it better than I know myself. There is one large room where the wash tubs squat. Clotheslines made of wire run across the ceiling among the water pipes. What could dry hair so far from warmth and light out of all moving air. Adjacent, there is an old coal cellar where we store tin cans and jars, a few tools, a broken wagon, and a rusting sled. A rug, which I don't remember standing on end in its roll like a sentry, leans against the wall like a sentry. Waterlogged now, it sags slowly into itself and smells gravely of wet wool and mold. The gray basement windows are like sightless eyes. The fourth room contains the body of the furnace with all its wrapped white pipes. It became a gulliver too great to move when we converted to oil, and the new furnace sits there too in a corner boxy and efficient, painted an electric blue. A leaky water heater, which never got hauled away, stands by its replacement like a metal memento mori. I measure my height against the still bright cylinder. Dials come up to my nose. Time cannot do to ordinary things what we timelessly do to one another, I announce although in a careful whisper, repeating the first sentence of my masterpiece. And the sound is soaked up as if I spoke to a world of sand. 
The first thing I shall need is an excuse. I've known that all along, but I can't think of any. We're not in the body burying business. I can't pretend to be canning pears or running the old ringer or turning out chair legs on a lathe. She is nervous, nervous, suspects X, fears Y. No one in his right mind would spend more than a minute down here. However, I am not in my right mind, am I? I am in my left mind now, leaving like Columbus for a new world's freedom and for fame. Dear seller, my concealed cell, where I shall be a mole, if not a monk. Everywhere the bulbs are bare, of course, and hang from the cord which sends them light. The rough walls are poorly wedged and weakly mortared. Insects gather in the cracks like dirt and damp. The most obnoxious kinds of bugs, I'm happy to say, because they are my protectors, my allies in these new dig-down days. Millipedes and pale gray roly-polies, oozy slugs, roaches quick as a cricket's click, and spiders with soft, sticky webs and angry black backs playing at the poisonous, pretending to be pouncy. I give praise. I render thanks to them. There are nine stagnant rows of rocks, and each rock is roughly nine inches high and about a foot long. The mortar in some places nexist pa and seems meant to be more of a plug than adhesive. The floor is cement washed smooth over cobbles, I think, and with my pick, that's what I've now proved. In any case, it undulates like land. I am not much more than five and a half feet beneath public footfall when I squeeze myself behind the old octopipe. That's not far. It's scarcely a beginning. There will certainly be drains, some septic plumbing. Have to be careful of that, the gas lines. And I shall want to run under the whole room, not simply pop under one outer wall like a con. Suppose I were suddenly to encounter my wife in this place, or like a rat, she, me. What in the world are you doing back there, Coley? she inquires. What do I intone in my turn? Well, Marty, you see here an historian hunting for a false cause, for a reason why I'm here, which will not be the reason why I'm here. Come off it. What's going on? I'm thinking about digging a tunnel, you know, to escape from the camp. Can the crap, she says in her most hardened manner. Ah, you see, I say, I've told you the truth, but what does the truth receive? Abuse, cuffs, disbelief. I've told you the truth as I always do, when I know you really want me to hand you a lie on a paper plate like something the cats shat. Well, Coley, you're a queer one. You've been tiptoeing around the house for weeks, like some cartoon creature pursued by the furniture, and now I've caught you skulking in the back of this heap of rust. I am down here, my dear, looking for a reason to be down here. She really hates it. Come on, Co, don't play the wimp. Come straight. Her ghost is imposing, floating up stage like a prima donna, though she's not into her mad scene yet. She's playing mine. But how do you speak to a ghost if you're not an Elizabethan? Ah, I'm a scholar, and thus well fit for it. Most ghosts come out of a corpse, like a breath full of words, but Marty's pale face betrays no vagrant spirituality. It is blank of being. That's what makes her a ghost. Anyway, what an absurd question. What am I doing? 
List, fair queen, but list is what the ghost says. But say you're a nation, Marty, a little country, and I march in to steal your wealth and take your land and rape your women. Shall I confess before my crime's commission and pass across the world's fair face like an evil shadow? Shall I? Or shall I argue that I've come to recover my countrymen, marooned in your cities like shipwrecked sailors on Circe's Isle? Eh? Shall I say that? And when I rescue my minorities by extending their fatherland over them like a sheet, a pertinent ambiguity in our present circumstances, poignant even, the justification I need for my deed, like a brass plaque at a murder site, is sweetly complete. The couplet means the scene is over, Marty, excellent all but the octopipe being real. So you see, Marty, I'll say, I'm simply down here examining the size of the old furnace because I am considering having it hauled away. Eh? How's that? I shall spread my arms as though to lie about a fish. Can't you see a ping-pong table here and the pitter-patter of little balls about and a dartboard there in the shape of a heart? Do you hear the rhyme, old soul? like the menacing beat of my army's boots, thap, thap, thap. Are you beating your meat back there? Is that why I'm getting a speech instead of an answer? That is the sound of darts embedding themselves in the cork. You always were hand in love with yourself, Willie, I will say that, Martha says. That, that, that. Yes, I am beating out, Marty, as dust from a rug. I am going off, off into a world of words like Columbus to discover an old land heel call new. But Martha does not jiggle a tit at my jokes, my nervous jibes, and stares at me as if I were imaginary. Columbus may have been a mocky, Marty, think of that and he burnt blacks in the Indies as an example to others who might have taken it into their woolly heads to be as lazy as their nature naturally inclined them. Wilfred, what are you writing in there? What are all those pieces of paper you've been secreting about between uh, books and such? What is happening? In where? In here? In there. Won't you ever finish? Won't you ever give over scribbling and come out? I've locked myself in my pen for safekeeping. Co, I am writing myself into a whirl world, Martha. The circulation of sound shall draw me up, 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 up. I am overcoming certain Protestant pressures from my past by wailing away on my weenie. Oh, Co, cut it out. Flow on, sweet flow, till I tell my tune. Oh, flow, you sugared girl and cookie-hearted whore, our name for time. Thanks to Governale, time with a capital like Columbus, back in Ohio. Remember those eerie nights of, where we used to go to visit once every morose moon, to visit my above-ground parents, buried in the air like certain savages? Your description, M.K.M., as your luggage still says, from B.C. our marriage, and one you wouldn't have employed if you had seen a few plein-air ceremonies, the dead propped up in heaps, thrown down in ditches, corpses by the cornfield, tumbrel, truckload, hay wain, rucksack, wheelbarrow, busload, train clothed, half-clothed, disheveled, slit, stripped, naked, limbed and unlimbed, washed and laid out, dirty and dumped and gut-ripped and raw and rotting, half-melted, part-burned, starved, a fuzzy cunt once, so innocent and lovely, what a loss. Their love spoiling like cut fruit, dear parents, 
Soon there'd be the bees buzz as they come to the juice, and the flowers would bend with them, the petals of the roses like blood on the brown ground, back in Ohio, in flow, early in our marriage. But not before your cunt had closed like a bankrupt company and caused my depression. Cut it out. The basement best resembles a dungeon. That's why I'm here. I am a character in a Dumas novel, falsely accused. That's why I'm here, because I waste away while adding on, pace all the spaces of my days with a mental measure, so far, so square, so long, and do slanty lines to keep a calendar, etch initials, mottos in the walls, recite my heart to keep my head. O oh God, deliver me from the body of these bones. Remember in Ohio, sleeping in my childhood bed and stroking my penis to remind me of my youth when I lay alone, holding its heat as if that warmth were the only sign of life. Tell me what you're doing down here, she says, besides getting soot on your fly and have the dignity, the decency, to tell it straight, the way it is, not what it's like. Meanwhile, while you're getting your guts up for it, let me tell you something, Willie. You aren't funny. Sure, you crack wise, but there's no fun inside, no crunchy kernel. Your wit is all shell, she says, hard over hollow, like a walnut pretending to be a beetle, she says, with her customary nerve-grating explicitness carrying every figure to its last place. I am growing culpable, I answer, Mia, Mia, capable of culp. And Martha's lips draw themselves up in a groats. I shove my stomach past a pipe, listening to the cellar dampen just the way I heard, tiptoeing carefully down the stairs, the house haunt itself. Then I am startled by gunfire, like a rattle of pans in the sink. This won't be easy. Far too risky with Martha in the house. Yes, siree, that tread above me does not belong to the funny fat lady who lives in the apartment on the next floor. No, she can descend through the ceiling like a god. I complete my circuit of the furnace. I am lecturing on history, educating the asbestos. So it's like adding a man to the firing squad in order to argue that the extra gun fired the fatal shot. I check my fly for soot. I'm too big for this business. It'll be hard to get my belly through that opening. A past event is like a slain man, tied to a post, my dear, with all those deadly bullets in him, and historians standing around like county coroners claiming that the bullet threw the belt or the button did it. Yesterday I said the same thing to my class. They snored without making a sound. In the snow-cold moo-moo of a ghost, Martha's face fades as her torso solidifies, her Aryan blood surfacing like lard. I work on her features, but I've forgotten what they are, the way I sometimes forget how to spell the commonest words when I'm writing them on the board. Without a mouth, she'll still talk back, from her crack like as not. A cause? A reason? There are so many. It's a good place to spend the summer. I'll have to take out the dirt in little dribs and drabs, or she'll get wise. And where shall I dispose of it? An abandoned well. That would be nice. If Uncle Bolt were about, I could fill him up. Okay. Do you know why Culp and I and all the guys make our smart remarks? We are embarrassed by experience. We are one warm blush. We don't know which way to look 
as when I blundered upon the bread man, humped upon my mother, lumped upon the sofa. Life suddenly becomes a dirty joke. A cause, a reason, what is not a cause? A fly in my ointment. There have been several occasions during the last few years I've incised them in these seeping cellar walls the way a prisoner marks his bath days. B, check, check. When your genitals were genial, when you looked at me with something like contentment, when you simply enjoyed a joke, put a sugared finger to my mouth. Moments might be a better word when some of my old feelings for you reappeared like that boyhood friend one hardly recognizes and can know. Nervous, longer cherish. Could I express them now, now that you tug nervously at the nervous skin of your left hand as though pulling a glove? Now that you buy your smiles on sale at the cosmetics counter? Now that you rebound from every bump like a balloon? Yup. Once you were a heaped and steaming plate. Well, I've eaten of you, licked you so you squirmed. I've choked you down, got fatter from your fat. But this hunger I have is misplaced in front of an empty dish. A cause? I need my exercise. A reason? Everyone ought to have a hobby. A vagina to China. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, the radio would wonder. It is that third room, that heart of the house, the distant chamber in those gothic horror stories where a dead spouse lies undisturbed in a shroud of cobwebs and dust. Meet my marriage, looking as if she were alive, I vow. Yes, it is the secret ventricle where the dead blood goes, that space under the sun porch where I keep my trunk of German memorabilia, nothing much, a flag, insignia, armbands, a pair of boots, a few hats, photos, letters from Magus Tabor, etc. One warning proclamation, and so on, a flask for schnapps, a collection which Martha has forbidden to rise above the level of the cellar, although no stake's been driven through these souvenirs to guarantee their death. So there's really nothing to prevent a little silver braid from winking in the dim light, or those black boots, naturally blacker in the black of night, from prowling the house, or some of that anti-Semitic porno stuff reading aloud to itself in a slow, soft, guttural voice until the swagger stick nearby gets stiff. Of course, I felt like a fool, forcing my way into an abandoned furnace as though it were a safe. I had no faith in what I was doing. There was no gold, no goal. I couldn't confront the absurdity of it. I went from whim to whim like a bee. I told myself I was going to dismantle the thing and carry it bit by bit out of the house. I told myself that I would remove the water heater too, one way or another. But I was simply a fat, melancholy man with a crowbar, a Paul Pry. Our world is old, Martha, don't you see? And all our dreams are ironies. Our pieties have been exposed. What principle is not a prejudice? And our philosophies rot in the back lots of our culture like struck sets. Oh, my, such a speech, she says. You must have studied the Latins. You must have pebbled a lot of Demosthenes. Not least Cicero. Demosthenes, Cicero, such recondite references, and you only a girl with a groat's mouth. Yes, I am that age that Cicero had reached when, in a bit of peace between one Rome and another, he wrote of the orator's art.
as I frequently contemplate and call to mind the times of old. Doesn't his great work begin? Pish! Pish, you say, Marty, pish! I'm your wife, and lower half, and I can pish on you all I want. You are my memory's ghost, Martha, a sheet of insubstantiality without fat or fiber. So there were days of old even for Cicero. And what permits happiness to an honest and honorable man, our orator is asking. That's the direction of this great oral gesture, the gist, the pith, and pish of it. And his answer is peaceful employment and dignified retirement. But the times had made a balls of everything. And so, now on the dark side of his life, this man who spoke his penship to the page begins his book as I, in my damp days as well, commence my labors. Oh, I know my Cicero, my dear. Didn't I have to get a handle on the harangue with old Tabor as my master and Der Führer as my subject? I had to lay my eyes on all the ancients, but particularly on this man, spokesman for me now, man of the hour at least for a day, because in nearly a thousand letters, not to mention his essays and orations, he told the truth about himself and his time, the stupid bastard. He was a damned indiscretion industry. Well, that charming frankness has blackened his name. The toga fell from his torso, and there he stood, exposed and solid and unembarrassed as a statue, a man who paid for his bad judgment with his life, who was never as good as his word, but a man worthy of the shit of pigeons. He longed for peaceful employment and a dignified retirement. But he knew he would have to take sides, join the ROTC or the phalangists, be a breaking rock or broken window. If I am to emulate his honesty, then I shall have to tell the most revealing of my lies. I must dig a hole through this house. Well, I've begun. I feel some soreness already because my hands have not yet hardened to it. The pen and not the pick, is their peaceful and customary employment. I shall descend and bend, creating a hole, as Culp would certainly say, twelve philippics deep. And Cicero, disholed, had his hand nailed to the rostrum he had so often ennobled with his eloquence, nailed there alongside his unkempt head, which silenced him not at all, of course, because his tongue was still loose, his voice howls even now for vengeance, although now its noise must be redirected away from Catiline, a ghost which only Cicero's own orations let live, and sent against that mass murderer, mankind, whom he once mistakenly extolled, a murderer who walks among us with all of Catiline's arrogance and effrontery, full of plans for our death. Who will kill the killers when their killing is completed? The Germans did away with millions ineffectually because millions of guilty ones remained, pretending to decorate and dignify their cities like so many public fountains, while really fulsomely pissing on one another and offering to their mutual concerns the comfort of breasts and heads of stone. In the name of heaven, you scurrilous buffoons, how long must our patience be abused? How long will man's savagery deface our so-called human look and make a mockery of us? To what limit, to what an ending, will you go? Who of us is any longer in doubt of our depravity? Do we need another demonstration? For we know what we did yesterday in Europe, what we do today in Africa and Asia, what plans we have to destroy tomorrow itself, as though time 
were a fellow creature. O ye wraiths, ye absent gods and dead immortals, look upon us here. What an age! What moralities! Empty skies, plaster eagles, TV faces and their blatant lies are now our leaders. Look on us then and laugh your fill, at least while we remain to be amusing. My big book, like this big house, hangs over me as though it were the limits of the universe. The under you, a world of guilt and Germans, innocents and Jews, and like Cicero's of murderers murdered. This house must have a cellar, a wrath keller, Culp would certainly say. There must be an underworld under this world, a concealment of history beneath my exposition of it, a gesture which will symbolize my desperation. O oh, my father, country, house of Kohler, hole up here, cling to the furnacy end of this hollow rope, relinquish the air for the earth. A plaque on the front door may one day read, Herein lies a pointless passage put down by a pretender to the throne of darkness. Let God uproot this pathway if he likes. We shall still stare at the hole the hole has left and wonder at the works of man and marvel at the little bit that mostly is and at the awkward lot that mostly ain't. Martha hates it when I shape my sentences. She says it doesn't sound sincere. Wouldn't it be nicer not to know the past, not to remember the madness of your mother, anger of dear old dad, the days of dressings down, to forget how much had been forgotten and the consequent neglect of friends and children, to feel that making love could still be luminous. Knowledge of good and evil, Martha, that's what we were forbidden, and not without reason. But now, now we know all the ins, and that has put us on the outs. Martha hates it when I shape my sentences. She says it falsifies feeling. It is a killer, knowledge is, the big K. It's the reason why you're hovering around down here in your light white nighty, Martha. You want to know what I'm doing down here, why I've been tiptoeing through the house and fearful of the furniture lately. You want a bit of info concerning my peculiar behavior. Well, if you knew, what would you do? You would unmold like a lamb made of butter. History with the great H, Governale's idol, has destroyed tragedy, the epic as well, Sabining the muses, and only incidentally done in love, marriage, kingship, religion, the Wild West, because heroes are creatures created by ignorance. Like infatuations, they are born of hype, of superstition, fraud, as are gods, saints, and movie stars, and they all pass into legend, myth, romance, still further fictions like clouds into clouds. Old Cicero, it seems, can only be admired so long as we haven't read his letters and thus learned of his fears and hesitations, his envies and ambitions, as long as we remain ignorant of his all-too-human nature. Do you want to wonder at Albert Schweitzer, Mahatma Gandhi, Churchill, Charles de Gaulle? Believe in Washington and play at Lincoln Logs? Goody, first put out your eyes. Blind, you will dream them clearly. Why do you go on so, Martha says? You have more superstitions than a monk. It's true, I do. Marty, you're right. I believe what Culp believes, in dry, tender, and a hot cock. Oh, for Christ's sake, cut it out. 
You never tire of talking, do you? Whether there's anyone about or not, because otherwise you're not alive. How would you know you still had a soul if it weren't always leaking logoi? That's why I'm down here, Marty, with my pick and shovel, putting a hole through the middle of fur ace. Look at that gap. God, like an upside-down smoke hole in an oven. No one will find it hidden between fur and ace. Who would suspect that pair? Or even pair them in the first place? So, at least, that's safe. I shall need to lose weight, look nice for my new lover and her eight arms. Trajan's column is a solid tunnel turning through the sky, while my pillar will be made of air and go the other way. It will celebrate defeat, not victory. For if our heroes have clay feet clear to their cocks, our villains can be believed. There's no hell or hellfire, maybe, but there are fiends with forks. We can trust our traitors, our Judases, our Quislings. We can count on any con. Attila will never disappoint us. Stalin will remain stainless in his steel. We're all charter members of the 4-H Club. Hitler, Hess, Heydrich, Himmler. Heil nani nani and a ho ho ho. We're even a bit put out with Mussolini because he was too comical a character, a cartoon Caesar, and, like that image on the tarot card, an upside-down clown. Oh, I know, it is the ghost's word, your word, Martha. But as I tell my students, list, list. Sure, sure, it's too simple to say that in our hearts only evil is real. But in fact, the good, well, there is no big G. There are just dinky ones. And even they are fragile, intermittent, short-lived little pleasures, pulling on your prick things, ambiguous, often costly in the long run, sometimes painful, embarrassing even, while wickedness prospers with a weed's ease. Rats are doing fine, flies ditto, pigeons, starlings, sparrows, they know how to eat off the streets and soil cement. Damn, it does drag one down, the dinginess down here. I'll need light. How can I keep the cords concealed? Air will be at a premium. What else? Why must one bring the world into the tunnel when the tunnel is supposed to be the way out? Lay the length of a lasting love alongside any hate. That of the Armenians, for instance, the Turks for the Greeks, the Serbs for everybody. Do you suppose if the Armenians had been done a good turn back then, instead of being thinned, they would remember? Three square meals and clean clothes and corded bales and darned blankets and bandages and modern medicines for their festers and their flu? Would such deeds be held tenderly against generations of grateful hearts? No one would think so. No one. No. So now my book is done. Guilt and Innocence in Hitler's Germany needs only its impossible introduction to go forth. And what is all my labor worth? What does my work do but simply remove some of the armor, the glamour of evil? It small ease it. It shakes a little sugar on the shit. It dares to see a bit of the okay in our great bugaboche inexcusable. Slander our saints, if you will, but please leave our Satan undefiled by any virtue, his successes inexplicable by any standard. Great undulating banners red as blood, and the brass bands, and the manly thud of uniformly set-down boots, and the rage inside the happy shouts. A hundred thousand spleens have found a mouth. 
Curtains of sperm are flung up the side of the sky. Hell has fertilized heaven. And now the hero comes, the trumpet of his people, and his voice is enlarged like a movie's lion. He roars, he screams so well for everyone. His tantrums tame a people. He is the son of God, if God is resentment. And God is resentment. A pharaoh for the disappointed people. If you want to think about something really funny, kiddo, consider the fact that our favorite modern bad guys became villains by serving as heroes first to millions. It is now a necessary apprenticeship. Martha hates being called kiddo. She thinks it the first letter of condescension. But if you want to think about something really funny, consider how the titles of tyrants change. We shall suffer no more emperors, kings, czars, shahs, or Caesars to lop off our limbs and burn our homes, kiddo, defile our women and bugger our boys. The masses make such appointments now. The masses love tyranny. They demand it. They dance to it. They feel that their hand is forming the first citizen's fist. So we shall murder more modestly in future. Beneath the banners of Il Duce, Der Führer, the general secretary, or the party chairman, the CEO of something. I suspect that the first dictator of this country will be called Coach. Outside the sky is a hard blue, as though glazed. It won't let a cloud cross, a bird in. Leaves are landing with the sound of sand. The sun has scissored its shadows out of the earth and walls and sold the silhouettes. Side nose view of someone with a flowing tie, steel beam, trouser pocket, twat made of twigs. The air would snap like a soda cracker if there were some soup on the spoon in my mouth. It is a day of definition, of clean and crisp distinctions, like the dance of a fine mind. It is a day to move through without guilt or desire. And I have been down in the dirt, commencing my dig. Thoughts have their shadows, too, Contours one could cut around, places they deprive of light. The sophisticated symbol of the tunnel, for instance, completes itself in the darkness of act. It is buried in the literal, in das plumpe denken, in the vulgarities of practice. I had first hammered a hole through the cement only to strike rock but I pried a heavy stone loose with my pick and soon held a big white boulder between my hands like a bowling ball. I've been wondering whether I should keep it as a souvenir. Scrubbed and bleached, it could hold back a door or sit like a skull on my desk. The shopkeeper frames his first sale, nails a banknote to the wall, to a chain fastens the first dime he ever made in a ringlet of stainless steel. Perhaps I should keep a photographic record, too, befores and afters, the initial knock, the open door, the deeper stages of the dig, her panties on the floor, the piles of earth taken out, the confident sly look on my face, the head of my cock peeking from between her squozen boobs like a pig in a blanket, the mummy's curse, the sly smug look on my face, pieces of pot laid out to suggest the vessel. Signed snaps of stars and local notables, athletes and gangsters, each, it seems, squeezed in the same booth so the smiles would surface. They row the restaurant's walls. Like my signed official photograph of Goering in full regalia that's chested down in number three, dark chamber of the heart, with Susu's severed head and the folded quick click of a daughter 
going down on her dad. That's the storyline. Though even there, in the old shoebox and soldier's trunk, my silent symbols lie. It is a day to be without aches and pains, without duties, without any bondage to belief, uncoupled and unculped. It is another day. Culp. Culp is a calamity. He is a punishment for my sins, a plague of boils, a subcutaneous itch, a neural jangle. After everyone else has walked out of my mind, he lingers like a bad smell. Culp claims to be an historian. He claims a special knowledge of the American Indian. He heads up a troop of scouts. They make moccasins and wear them on hikes. They make arrowheads out of flints, bows from the bushes, tomahawks out of stones tied to sticks. Culp is a kind of encyclopedia of survival. He shows his kids how to create headdresses from the feathers of table turkeys and city pigeons. He teaches them how to pound stale beef, rancid suet, and raisins only rabbits drop into moist splats with a wooden mallet and shape the mix into sullen, intractable cakes. He tells them it will stick to their ribs. He tells them it will help them live a long time underground. Pemmican, it's good against the bomb. Culp's kids paint their faces with berry juice and dance as though demented in ungainly figure eights. They like to take overnights, sleep on the ground, cook in tin cans like tramps, sing around a dying fire. Culp also knows about corn silk and canoes, how to roll, how to smoke, how not to tip, how to write, if anyway and he has memorized some Indian chat, or so he claims, which charms the children, perhaps because his flat cheeks puff. But I think it's because they adore adults who play the fool and make themselves look ridiculous. Of course, to Culp, it matters. Deer spoor, land lie, moss growth, cloud code. Culp believes. He carries his beliefs about, like a charm to ward off disease. He doesn't exactly believe that beliefs are male or made of money like the Mormons, but it is easy to imagine him going from door to door, the wigwam magazine in hand, pleading to be let in so he can harangue some poor soul about the glorious history and present plight of the red man. Because he is convinced of the superiority of Indian culture and the nobility of its savages, he feels he must also believe that Indian blankets are better and more beautiful than Persian rugs, that Indian horses never stumble, tire, grow old, or leave tracks, that Indian arrows fly true, that their medicine men know both men and medicine in a deep mystical sense and perform miracles as easily as we remove warts and cut corns, that their squaws sow and serve, their elders advise wisely, passing the pipe of peace from hand to hand and measuring the present by the sacred practices of the past, that therefore their rare confederacies were more perfect unions, bound as the body is by blood. But most of all, Culp believes that the Indian is untiring, stealthy, resourceful, and stoically brave. Ah, Culp is a man of cliché, the way some men are men of the cloth. Of the loin cloth, Culp would certainly say. Hence he believes that the Indian is a man of honor, and a man of his word, and a man of his bond. He believes that societies without writing are spiritually free, not stupidly becalmed. He believes in killing and roasting your own meat, growing your own grain, cleaning your own fish, 
tanning your own hides, slaying your enemies and settling scores, living as the sun and the snow and the seasons demand, following the great herds, worshipping bears and snakes. Culp drives a pickup with a tarp that leaks and fancies ponchos that let rain run down his neck. He pretends he can track, catch fish with his hands, make a fire by spinning his prick. Yet he lives in a little prefab the color of a dying daff and has named his kids Deborah and Andrew. Andrew for the movie Rooney and Deborah because everybody is born a Debbie these days. Andy and Debbie, how do you like that? Not missed in the morning or after the name of a friendly Indian like Wawatam or that of the fierce and unforgiving Minamavana, chief of the Ojibwes. No, Debbie, spelled D-E-B-B-Y, and Andy, spelled A-N-D-I-E. On Halloween, he will set his whole troop on me, each kid naked to the waist, capering in my living room, Culp too, with his twelve war-whooping boy sopranos, his normally smirky face chalk-white, cheekbones on fire with vermilion. I always hope for frost or rain or a sudden snow that night. The little snots trying to scalp me because I've given them candy canes left from last Christmas. But why should they complain? At least it's not cookies containing pet poop or sneezing powder. One of my own kids, Carl, is in their company. But how could I have decently prevented it? Howling louder than all the others, the wretch, and brandishing his homemade tomahawk in my face. Culp insists that he can interpret the ferocious designs and symbols of Iroquois war paint, and so the children cover their arms, face, and torso with egg dye and cake color while enjoying a state of sick, self-loving, sybaritic pleasure unique to the age of eleven. Culp has them rattle off the names of God knows how many American Indian tribes as though they were reciting the capitals of the states. I scarcely know the makeup of the five nations. Even at the university, he springs this Indian lingo on us as if there were a jack in his mouth. To an innocent and normally unmeant good morning, he will respond with something jolly in Ojibwe. To his how, I say, heil, but he thinks that's fun. Though Culp's features are far from Indian, he is lean and swarthy, with dark eyes, in fact, like Lou's. I suddenly see that. Neighbors deceive you about the nature of the neighborhood. Another nose alters the angle of the eye. Front stoops with ethnics squatting on them do the same. Shirley Temple's indecent gestures subvert little orphan Annie's, even on the comics page. Still, from a distance, Culp seems presentable and reasonable and normal enough. Approach, however, and you will hear whirs and clicks, rhymes and puns, jocularities in dialect, jingles in dirty high school ease, gibberish, he says, is pure Sioux. Culp's conversation is made up like his Halloween Indian's face. It is simply streaked with zaps, weeps, and other illustrative noises. I guess I shouldn't say simply, or streaked either. That's not exact. His speech is not outlined or punctuated with clacks or thonks in any ordinary way. It is engulfed in them, washed with them, as though they were spit, the way street sounds surround us. Surrounded us, you remember, during that intense noontime tete-a-tete -tete -tete in a sidewalk cafe where I confessed my passion to an emptied cup and you lifted your chin to look coolly away. Yet that comparison is not correct either, since Culp's incessant zits, yelps, 
zooms, and hip-hips intervene. They serve as symbols themselves and carry on the action. If his pickup hasn't started, first we hear last night's icy wind and the oil in the engine thicken. The truck's doors open with a groan, which he gives us. His trousers slither over the ah cold seat, and the key snicks, entering its lock. The engine's frozen agonies are minutely replayed. The starters grind, the muffled puff of a single cylinder firing. Then the smell of a flooded engine is delicately rendered by, as if from a distance, the bassoon. Finally, Zerbloom, gloom, room, maroom. There is palpable silence, an emptiness in the line on the page. In the corridor there's no one, or the heart. Culp shrinks. He is shifting into another scenario. His right hand becomes a dinky little car, puck, puck, puckering along toward school. I heard not a single pucket as I approached the crowded café. The clatter of the city collected like lint in an unconscious corner. The corner, perhaps, the café was bent around. A comic strip. Culp loved to reenact them, enliven their lines. He was surely brought up on Mickey Mouse and Porky Pig. He falsettos in fright as they do. He zips. He squeals to a halt. He varooms. He tisks. He thonks. His thonks are worthy of the Three Stooges. He does all the Popeye voices, but prefers olive oils. He has noises for the nittles, the grolics, the quimps, the jarns. He blows each balloon up before your ears. He reels home, pluses on his eyes, singing the spurl that rises like heat from his head. Don't ask him the time. He'll tell you it's dong, 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 a ding, and ten ticks. I must admit, he does a nice imitation of Plan Man T's mind turning over. You remember. A small green hedge, not boxwood, I think, protected us from the street, and an awning striped like peppermint shaded us from an intense noonday sunshine which lay liquidly in the spoons. Remember? I am asking what has happened, why you've changed that old bit of emotional business, and the street sounds safeguard your answer from any other ear. I believe, Bill, you do not say. I've finally grown up. You say, remember? You say it's time to move out of the old neighborhood. What sounds would Culp use to render that cut? How can a man who wants to be an Iroquois and wipe his ass with leaves go about huffing and clacking like some rusty machine? How can a man who puns with such compulsive passion believe that there is, in fact, a wealth of wisdom in the world, that these aphorisms he collects are actually true, these gnomic wise guys he reveres are really honest. How, I ask in Culp's resonant Choctaw, and in that fashion, which is firmly his, complete the joke. Ah, yes, Culp believes. He is as crammed with beliefs as peanut butter is with goodness. He believes that the hard ground is great for your back, that leaves will cure eczema, impetigo, halitosis, gonorrhea, jaundice, the Jim jams, anything, with the exception of a few inner ailments only roots reach or bark relieves, like my gongorism, he says, which little else will touch, not even nuts which solidify the stool or those berries which make you shit in a stream. Roots for culp are another universal remedy, they can restore a missing foreskin or soothe chapped teeth. He believes, as a drunk doesn't, in the next day. He believes that the Indians' dogs were devoted, not just hungry, 
that squaws were better in their blankets than a co-ed on the lawn, that Indians reared their kids to be kings, breathing nobility through nostrils taught to flare, and he papoosed his own baby all over town to improve its disposition. Don't pack the squimp on your back, he says. Put it against your chest where it can hear the heart and smell milk. He believes that alcohol pickles the liver, that cigarettes darken the lungs like the sides of caves. Yet he loves caves, firelight, primitive man, and his magic markers. He believes that savages are children, but the children are pure and upright like saplings, not yet bent by the wind, not yet dampened by the rain. Odd that my thoughts should be interrupted by that little round marble-top table where we sat, by a few crumbs the sparrows would eventually eat, and by the lazy strip of cellophane you'd pulled from a pack of camel cigarettes, and which now lay across the rim of your saucer. None of this was normal for you, not the cigarettes, one of which you were trying awkwardly to extract, nor the chocolate you were drinking instead of espresso, nor the cold clench to your thin, pale hands, those pensive, watchful eyes which used to moisten my face with their emotion, darting by me now like startled neons. No, nor the prim, white color of the collar on your blouse, not to be must, nor your lipstick, which had a hint of purple in it, like a sunset, not to be smeared. My throat was suddenly full of puns, bad jokes, and all sorts of snappy retorts, like risen bile. It was awful. It was awful. She was giving me the sack. And I realized, as I formed the words, how she was also kicking me out of hers. I smiled. I smiled. Culp smiled when he sent one of his culpagrams. When the worm has eaten the apple, the apple is in the worm. A smile then, like the glassine window in a yellow envelope. I smiled. In that selfsame instant, too, I thought of the brown, redly stenciled paper bag we had the grocer refill with our breakfast oranges during the splendid summer of sex and sleep just past, of sweetly sweating together, I would have dared to describe it then. For we were wonderfully foolish and full of ourselves, and nothing existed but your parted knees, my sighs, the torpid air. It was a bag, that bag, we'd become sentimental about, because, its neck still twisted where we'd held it, you said it was as wrinkled and brown as my balls, and resembled an old cocoon, too, out of which we would both emerge as juicy and new as the oranges, like monarchs of melody, and so on. And I said to you simply, Dance the orange, a quotation from Rilke, and you said, What? There was a pause, full of café clatter. What was I doing by that time? Grinning like a ghoul? Thank you for making this easier for me. Did you, cliché, say? You said. That was when you compared me to an old neighborhood. Nothing commonplace about that. There was so much blood in my head, I heard you as if from a distance, as if my sinuses were stuffed. The flimsy red string of cellophane blew from the table like a strip of breeze, and I said, Thank you for shopping at IGA. Just as I feel the culp come up in me when I malice my Martha, my misery, my missus, I felt it then, losing without grace or even decency the only satisfying lover in my life, because I had put the problem in those words, getting the sack, and then seeing only the hard, oblique light from the spoons, the lift 
of the little length of cellophane like a sail in that short sigh of air, your smoothly filed and lacquered nails tweezing a cigarette from its pack, a fragment of tobacco clinging to one red edge, and then remembering the smell of orange peel on my fingers as if it were my own quick and not the fruits. Each step of my mind taking me further away from what was happening, and indeed what was happening, from the terrible turn in your feelings, like the corner of the cafe, because I presume I couldn't bear to sit there and watch your tongue remove a small residue of chocolate from your lips the way you were removing me. Can I believe I have any hold on history? when I find my memory is made of marimba music, sack trash, and teapot trivia, stacks of calmly folded grocery sacks, for instance, with those silly sentences stenciled on them. Again, for instance, when I was having that soul-splitting quarrel with Martha, my misery, my missus, while she put away the groceries and I carefully flattened the bags and stuffed them in with the others to pretend to an accord, until we take one out later to line the garbage can so our souls wouldn't dirty. Martha fitting the broccoli into the crisper and screaming at the rear of the refrigerator right at the frost line. I recreasing the foldings in the sacks, smoothing out old wrinkles and yelling back like a bullhorn, the milk still steady on its rack. You slimy word snake, Bargains galore. I'll tell you what it's like screwing you. Four sticks of margarine brick up the butter keeper, a wedge of bags between tins of shortening like an elastic deck of cards. You ass-mouthed liar. At your neighborhood store, it's like trying to fuck a cooked cabbage after it's set a spell, after it's got cold, after its leaves have begun to wimp. Ah, there's a freezing wind passing through the troughs of the celery. Oh, Co, you, what a corny conceit. When you're dingle, you, you never say it straight. Always what it's like, not what it is. Well, your prick is a Polish pickle, she resolutely shouts, setting the jar inside and softly closing the door. I do not make the expected rejoinder. Her whole body is wide and white and seems to be suddenly just like the Kelvinator. You've left me holding the bag. Oh, I know, I'm the gab, when what you'd like to be holding is that skinny bit of five-and-dime baggage. Shop at Safeway, it's safer. Oh, Martha, you mean that skinny bit of baggage that this minute's giving me my sack back? And what does the stupid bag hold? It has held my childhood head, I remember, with scissored eyes and a painted mouth. I am the black knight of this one log bridge, and you shall not cross, Friar Tuck. I've killed ten of King Arthur's clumsy champions with the backside of a plow. Three billy goats gruff went down as easily as swallowing lard. I have unhorsed a heap of hot shots, too, each wearing their milady's favor, garter, scarf, or hanky, and I've done in a dozen dragons, descaled like fish. So take that and that, pow! Well, for Christ's sake, what are you up to now, running from symbol to symbol like someone needing to pee? She did say, my prick was a Polish pickle. What do you make of that? Would you rather be an old neighborhood? Would she have called my cock a gherkin if she had been holding a jar of those? A word with Polish roots, too, I shouldn't wonder. Indian in intention. Well, I didn't make the expected rejoinder, anticipating her reply, and considering the difference between the nature of her banter and the strength of her scream, the deliberate way she put away the groceries, this into that, nothing set down stressfully, nothing slammed or banged or battered. 
while the words came out of her with the violence of a sneeze.